On this week's Late Night with Monica Price, we take a look at the life of the legendary John Lennon of the Beatles, whose life came to an end all too soon when he was killed at the age of 40. I will be speaking to Leslie Ann Jones, a former Fleet Street journalist and now a best-selling author and broadcaster. Her latest book, Who Killed John Lennon, is a fascinating look into his life and takes a unique and often controversial viewpoint that Lennon killed himself by the self-sabotaging choices that he made throughout his life. Also joining me is a singer-songwriter and artist, Mike Powell, whose extraordinary story of his sighting in a dream of John Lennon turned his life around. Count 50 plus sightings later and a catalogue of songs he continues to write, all in the name of the great man himself. Let's take a look into their lives on Late Night with Monica Price. Mama, I've come back home to you. Mama, it's just great to be back Delighted to be joined now by the author Leslie Ann Jones. Leslie Ann, it's so lovely to see you. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Really wonderful. Now, this new book, Who Killed John Lennon, quite a controversial story, but and we'll talk about that. But first of all, I want to, because your background is journalism as well, isn't it? And you're a keynote speaker, and you seem to have written lots of things about musical artists. So my first question to you, Leslie Ann, is how did that come about? You know, what how did this all come about? I always knew that I wanted to write for a living. Um, My father was a writer. He'd been a footballer. He became a sports writer. Wonderful sort of Welsh wry sense of humour and uh, an interesting take on life my father had. And I always wanted to follow in his footsteps. And when I was a child, I met David Bowie. He was a local hero. I went to school in Bromley. He lived in Beckenham up the road. We used to go and doorstep him after school and get signed photos. And I said to my friend Natasha one day, She's going to be out, meaning his wife, Angie, and he's going to answer the door and he's going to have us in for tea. And this eventually did happen. And I remember sitting in this amazing Christmas coloured room with kind of red walls and bottle green furniture and silver ceiling. And it was also exotic, so different from my home and life. And I thought I have to grow up and be with people like this and work with people (laughs) like him. But how? I'm not musical. I wasn't artistic. Uh, And then the pennies dropped. I could do what my dad did, which would be I could go on the road with bands and artists and I could write about them. So I knew at a really young age what I wanted to do. And that's that is what I grew up to do. And I I wound up working at the Daily Mail as a rock and pop correspondent, touring the world with bands and writing reviews of concerts. That's where it all started. How amazing is that? And obviously not look back. I mean, you've written um, biography about Freddie Mercury, uh, Mark Bolan, and of course, um, the hardback copy of the Who Killed John Lennon, it was already out. And then the new paperback version has just come out. That's right, isn't it? It is. And I have it right here. Oh, that's 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 absolutely. Now, now this is quite a controversial book, isn't it, Leslie-Anne? You've, um, you know, it's kind of, it's it's come out to... acclaimed critics have said it's fantastic but it's a very different take isn't it on his life because we all know that John Lennon of course was gunned down on his doorstep by Mark Chapman but this is really looking at his life in a different way and almost the book kind of indicates that he was dead if you like for want of a better word before he actually even got killed. I wanted to look at when did the original John Lennon die as opposed to the John who was was murdered outside his home in New York on the 8th of December, 1980. There were various Johns and I needed to gather them all up and to compare and contrast them and work out why, because he was the kind of person who's self-sabotaged all the way down the line. So just as things would come good for John, he would kill off that John and move on to the next John. So at what point did the real John Lennon die? That was the question I set out to answer. And I found a few more Johns than I was expecting as well. Really? Mm. Isn't that interesting? And obviously you've interviewed, you've got, in fact, you've got 
interviews with people that have, have never been sh- unshown footage, unshown films. Inter- you've interviewed people that haven't been interviewed before. Was that something really important for you, Leslie Ann, that you, you know, you wanted to delve really a bit deeper into his life? As writers, we always have to find stories that haven't yet been told. And people will say, well, it's all been said about John Lennon. What, what is left? There's always something new to find and to tell. And I trust that fact whenever I approach a new book there will be new stories once you commit to the project that comes your way it's just a question of making a commitment to the person you're writing about and then those stories start to flow and they come in a very unexpected way I was having dinner with Johnny Hamp he used to be head of uh, light entertainment at, at Granada Television years ago And he and his daughter came out for dinner with me um, two years ago up in in the north, um, beyond Manchester. We were having this nice little dinner. His daughter is blind and she'd been blind since she was a child. There was a terrible accident at school and she'd lost her her sight. And by a series of coincidences, she had become godmother to Yoko Ono's daughter, Kyoko, who'd been stolen from Yoko when after John and Yoko got together and I thought we'd just gone out for dinner I wasn't yes. expecting this and this lovely lady started to tell me the story and I said how come you've never told this before she said yeah. I didn't think anyone be- would be interested I didn't think it was really a big deal but of course it was a big deal yes. because it led me down a path to finding the real reason why John and Yoko moved to New York mm-hmm. which wasn't to get away from the whole furore of the Beatles breaking up which is what is widely assumed. Yes. But it was to go looking for Yoko's missing child. And they, John and Yoko, were the most famous couple in the world at that time. They had greater resources than anybody at their fingertips. They never got that little girl back. And John never saw her again. And I would not have known about this story, but for that dinner with Meredith. Johnny Hamp's daughter, who set me on the path to go looking for it, yeah. Isn't that strange? And I mean, I didn't realise that. So they never actually ever found the daughter. No, they didn't. And it damaged uh, irreparably uh, John's relationship with Julian, his his son, because Julian was about the same age, about eight years old. And Yoko was so distraught, as you would be, your child is being taken away from you by the birth father, Tony Cox, it has to be said. But... The court had awarded Yoko custody. So the child should have been returned to her mother and she never was. And it would seem that she was also brainwashed into believing that John and Yoko were bad people and that she was better off away from them. And so John never saw her again. And then Yoko didn't see her until about 30 years later when Kyoko became a mother herself. And she then decided I should make contact with my own birth mother and so there was a reunion and I believe that now Kyoko is Yoko's um, main beneficiary of her fortune when she dies obviously there's Sean as well the the son that she had but but it's a tragic story to think just I mean a a a writer's dream though that you you must have been so enthusiastic to write about it and tell the story really excited and and of course everybody said well how come this is has, has never been told how come this has been a secret because the person who had the story tucked away in the back of her mind had not thought it was important and that's the thing tell. in many cases isn't it with with really good stories really good books people just have kept that information not really realize that anybody's going to even be remotely interested in it but of course the Beatles is a worldwide phenomenon people are always interested in the Beatles you know Peter Jackson the acclaimed filmmaker's got his uh, documentary coming out I think it's August that comes out this year (laughs) so you know it it, it, there's always going to be an interest but how did you sort of go about setting to start the book obviously you do a lot of research before Lizzie Ann but how does it work Always for me, it's everyone works differently, but for me, it's always the same, really. I, first of all, read everything I can lay my hands on. And that includes books, newspaper articles, uh, things I find online. And everything you read leads to you making notes and that leads to you investigating and leads you to read more things. I listen to all the music, everything that there is. And in the case of the Beatles, the the catalogue and John also, because his catalogue was very defined. It had a beginning, a middle and an end. 
there can be no more music. So it's even more valuable to us because of that. And then I obviously I watch the DVDs, a lot of footage, newsreel, that kind of stuff. And I start to set down my own thoughts and my opinions. I shape a storyline because every story needs a storyline. It's a story that you're telling. Yes. It might be a story that people think you, that they know and that is part of our collective culture, but but it's not really that. It's stories change all the time, like everything else. And also people rewrite their history. And John was very good at that. He was constantly re rewriting his own life story. So you'll get him saying one thing in one interview. Five years later, he'll contradict that and say something else. So you never quite know which John you're getting. And that keeps yes. you on your toes. I and then, then I sort of start to shape the story, break it down into sections, then into chapters, and then I start to write. But but I've done a lot of work by the time I start to write. Yes. Um, and the writing is the hard bit. Yes, I could imagine. And, and, yeah. and you, when you when you sort of come to write, do you obviously you've collected all that information that's all in your head and it's probably scattered around in notes around you? Mm -hmm. Do you kind of shut yourself off from the world then and and, and write, or how do you work? It's funny, some friends of mine say, oh, you know, we always know when you started a new book because you vanish for nine months. <laughs> we, we just don't see you. And that is pretty much what I do. I, I, yeah. I commit to it. Yes. And then it's a question of doing it every day. And you can't miss a day because if you do, it takes twice as long to do the word count for the day after. Oh, and I'm quite <laughs> regimented about it, actually. Yeah. I, I'm very strict with myself. Well, uh, and it's yeah it's enjoyable process yeah and I've and been then, doing it a long time now so. yes of course I was gonna say how that was going to be a question actually how long have you been writing now uh how long have I been writing probably about 30 years but wow. I've been writing books specifically since the mid 90s wow yeah. isn't that great and when you were um finding out about John did you find anything out about him that you really didn't know I mean apart from obviously you've just talked about the daughter was there anything else um, that surprised you or you had absolutely no idea? I didn't know how much John was shaped by the fact that his mother gave him away when he was about five years old. Uh, it's a terrible thing to do to a child, and he never overcame that. She gave him to her sister, John's auntie Mimi, who brought him up with a rod of iron and with no affection, really, no actual love. And John re-established his relationship with his birth mother in his early teens. And he started to go around to her house after school and spend time with her behind Mimi's back. And he had just begun to repair his relationship with his mother, who was obviously tremendously important to yes. him because she was a fantasy figure. He hadn't grown up with her. And that was just beginning to come together when she was killed right outside his door uh, where he lived with Auntie Mimi, knocked down by a car. And thereafter, every morning, John had to, I stood in his bedroom. I stood at the window and looked out of this window. He had to draw the curtains on this window every day on the view where his mother died. And it damaged him hugely. Mm. And I didn't know about that before. No. And so that really was the key to John, if you like, no. was the fact that the, the most fundamental relationship which inspired a lot of his songwriting. That tragedy that had happened um, was preceded by the fact that the woman he cleaved to the most had actually abandoned him. And so thereafter, all his relationships with women began to make sense to me wow. because all of them really were mother replacements. Yes, yes, yes. They were all older than him, uh, apart from Mei Pang, who was his girlfriend during the sort of wilderness years, the lost weekend years, he called them. But certainly Cynthia was a mother figure. She was only a little bit older, but she seemed middle-aged compared to John. And of course, they had to get married because she was pregnant. You did yes. in those days. Uh, but then he was a world famous Beatle. So he was living a double life. And that's a very difficult thing to do for anybody, let alone someone in their early 20s, who suddenly come from, from working class nothing to being a globally rich, famous, fated rock star. Yes. It's too much for a person to handle. He always seemed to shy away, didn't he, from the from the spotlight, John. He was always, he never really, you know, he never had the eye for the camera, as I say. You know, he, he always bowed his head down, didn't really like the media. When you were sort of talking to people, you know, writing your, before you were writing your book, Leslie Ann, did you discover that? Did you just, did you, did he, was he a, quite a shy man? How, how do you think he was as a man? I think he was quite bitter and quite twisted and, um, 
he he treated the whole thing with ridicule to some extent. And, you know, we've had stories, some of them are in my book, uh, how he would, for example, um, Im imitate physically a disadvantaged people, we would call them today. He would um, and make fun of people. And I always felt that was coming from some part of John that he couldn't control. And obviously that was to do with his own pain and suffering. Yes. And it's to be able to write a song like Help at the age yes. of 24 with such an upbeat melody to it, but a song that is really crying out for help. I need somebody, not just anybody, help. It's, yes. He's really screaming for someone to, to come to his aid. Mm. But of course, covering it all up in that nice sort of jocular Beatles way that people didn't really get John at that stage. And I didn't like John Lennon very much, I will confess, when I started to write this book. By the end of the book, I really loved him because I understood him and I got what his life was about. And it was a tragedy, but, but the triumph of it is that John had a complete life. Even though he was only 40 when he died, he'd achieved everything. He'd found real love and he'd managed to get his own essence across to the rest of the world to the point that 40 years later, we're still talking about him, yes. still playing his music, and it's, it's never awesome. going away. No, no, I don't think it'll ever go away. I think whenever you talk about the Beatles, it, it, it's just, it's, I don't think it will ever end. I, there is There has never been a band like it. The band members, obviously, they've all gone off and done their individual things. Obviously, sadly, um, you know, John got killed, but he got murdered. But they, they're still very much in the forefront of the music industry. Bands now still look at their music and as a, as a kind of guideline to what they're, they're trying to do. Do you feel in your book, does that, does that all that come across in the book? Musically, the musical John Lennon. Does, yeah. how, did you find anything out about him musically that, you know, was perhaps a little that you didn't have an understanding for or, or, or maybe attributed to, as you say, some of the way that he, his characteristics of, and how he behaved. I did. Obviously, I don't want to give it away, but no. I, because I would love people to read the Absolutely. business context and to see how the things going on behind the scenes in his private life powered his songs and his songwriting and how those songs have inspired so many other artists. Yeah. And it is as if all music today leads back to the Beatles. Even there are quite a lot of people who deny that, but I disagree. <laughs> and I have explained that, I hope, in yes. a way that, that is digestible in this book. Yeah. yeah. Oh, fantastic. Now, this book is out. Obviously, people can buy that now in, in all bookstores and, of course, online, mm -hmm. of course. And is it something that, where do you stop at, Leslie? Are you going to continue now? Are you getting ready to write another book or what's happening? I've completed another book, which oh, is wow. being published on the 2nd of September this year. It's called Love of My Life. Oh, and it's an examination of all the important relationships Freddie Mercury had that were left out of the film Bohemian Rhapsody. Yes. And so I wanted to gather all those people who were so significant to Freddie and reintroduce them and say, look, uh, he had these relationships. It wasn't just about Mary Austin and Jim Hutton, but there were these people as well who Freddie had huge passions for mm. and who occupied great, really important parts of Freddie's life uh, who were largely forgotten. And because they were left out of the film, Fans of Generation Z, as they call themselves, or we yeah. would say Z, Gen Z, are, uh, are unaware of them. So I want to bring those people back. And oh, that's, sure. that that, that's going to be amazing. And is there anybody yeah. else that you would like to um, write about? I am working right now on a new book about the Rolling Stones. Uh, believe it or not, 2022 will be their 60th anniversary of their first ever gig, Isn't which that I incredible? find incredible. Yes. <laughs> Their first ever gig was in yeah. July 1962. It's crazy, uh, isn't it? And so it's called The Stone drop. Age. The yeah. Stone Age is the book, and The Stone Age it has been, if you like. Uh, they are the greatest rock and roll band in the world. I, I personally feel, had the Beatles continued, the Stones as we know them today wouldn't be the Stones. Well, that's because interesting, the, isn't it? Yeah, the Beatles created a vacancy, didn't they? Yes, that's right. They did. They did. And I mean, with the Rolling Stones, who are you going to be interviewing? Have you got interviews lined up already for that? Have you started? I've done quite a lot, actually. Yes, already. I tend to stay away from the principles yes. because you don't want to write a hagiography. Yeah. I, <laughs> I was quite deeply involved with Bill Wyman and his friendship circle back in the 80s at around the Mandy Smith time. Yes. And I met all the other Rolling Stones because of that. And I have some quite um, 
uh, let's say, controversial views about oh. what happened there. And these are subjects we need to be talking about yeah. today, is effectively the abuse of young girls in the music business. Yes. Uh, I think Rock's Me Too moment is, is happening now. And we're beginning to look at those things with different eyes. Yes, absolutely. It sounds to me that when you write, um, you, you, you write, you, you want to get under the story. Would that be fair to say? You know, you, you don't want to have the sort of the bog standard, you know, biography that writers write. You, you want to delve much deeper into your subject. Is that something that you personally, Leslie, that you, that you, is that something that fulfills your need as a writer? I think so. I, I, I'm one of those weird people that people always tell things to. I can meet complete strangers in whatever random setting and they'll, within five minutes, be telling me their life <laughs> and really intimate details and things that you think, oh, you know, I wouldn't necessarily tell me that, um, especially not given what I do for a living. Yes. But I, my mum says, you have that kind of a face. You, you're just the kind of person that yes. people tell stuff to. So, which doesn't do me any harm at all. I was going to say, that's very good when I you're do. trying to get into your yeah. for, yeah. for books and things. And I'm very interested in emotions and yeah. psychology. And there's always, especially with male artists, women tend, you know, Joni Mitchell wrote every single scrap of her life in her songs. She yeah. wears her heart on her sleeve. It's not hard to find out what makes Joni Mitchell tick, but but male songwriters might tend to hold back a bit. And so we're not getting the full emotion. It's usually disguised. So there, you only have to scratch the surface and you begin to find what that might be about. So, so male emotions, male psychology is very interesting to me. Yeah, fantastic it's it, it's it's an amazing book I, I've seen it and I and I've I've looked at it and I just think it's an incredible book it really does take another look into the story of his life so um you know thank I you. wish all the success with it Lesian. thank you so much for joining me today and thank you very um, much yes with your other books as well they sound fascinating as well thank you so much for joining me thank you for having me Thank you. Right now I'm joined by, I would say, a very ordinary man. And forgive me for saying that about you, Mike. Um, let me introduce you to Mike Powell. Now, he's had an extraordinary connection with John Lennon. So we're staying, obviously, with the John Lennon theme. Mike, it's so great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, it's great to be here, Monica. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Thank you. It's, you know, you're from Liverpool. I can recognise yeah. that Liverpool accent already, which is wonderful. Yeah. Now, yeah. Mike, your story is really quite extraordinary. Um, you were, you know, just a man that was just going about his life in a normal way. And you suddenly had this connection with John Lennon, a dream, didn't you? And there he was. He appeared at the end of your bed, and which obviously we're going to talk about. And from right. there, you've become a singer-songwriter, you've written a book, and yeah, and you've painted. So, yeah. Mike, what an extraordinary story. Yes, yeah, incredible the way the way it came about. Uh, but I just, a uh, traumatic period of my life, um, I, I asked for help, and my mum and dad had been deceased um, since I was 25. I was 38 when this happened, and I asked for help went to the graveside and uh, then I went to the Anglican Cathedral in Liverpool. I had some time to kill to pick some printing up. So I just uh, asked and said, God, if you're there, please help me, you can see me. I need, it's as if I've given everything and I've got everything to give. Uh, and it's all being taken away. A week later, 15th of November, 1992, I wake up and there's an image at the end of my bed. I thought I was dreaming. Sat up, bolt upright, rubbed my eyes. He was still there, and I was absolutely petrified. So uh, what I did, I turned turned around like a child and tried to escape, like a child in a corner would hide and think they not can't be seen. Well, I was thirty eight years of age when this happened, and it was so traumatic. I thought to myself, "Am I imagining this? Have I gone mad?" And I, I had my arms over my head. And I looked under my arm and I saw him being taken away against his will. And from that second, I wasn't scared. And I thought, well, he doesn't mean, mean me any harm. I describe it as a football game, ironically, where everyone leaves at the final whistle. And you're trying to get through opposite. That's the way John was. He was the only one facing me. And there were hundreds of people, the backs of heads, just got taking him away. And he was standing, it's as if he was on tiptoes, his eyebrows were raised in his neck, and he didn't mean me any harm. And this, this uh, song came, words and music, just like you'd hear on the radio. 
but it was transmitted almost like an, an instant download. Now the first song was called It Was You, and that's, that, that's the song. I saw you facing a crowd the other day, I called to you, you turned and walked away, it was you. Uh, I couldn't believe it. I thought, well, this, this isn't me because I've never done anything. I've never written any poetry or English or anything. And, uh, and as I say, from, from that moment, I lay in bed. This was about half one in the morning. I got up about uh, five o'clock and this was just going round in my head. It was, it was just going round and round and round. The song was complete. Like, I just find it so strange, even now. It's incredible, actually, uh, Mike, isn't it? To think that, you know, it must have been quite frightening. As you say, it must have been quite frightening to have that. Now, you know, you've spoken about it many times and, and you know, people will say, oh, you know, this is a load of nonsense, you know. What, how, what do you say? Because since then, of course, since that very first sighting in uh, November 1992, you've gone on yeah. to have 30 plus more sightings. You've had numerous uh, songs now that you've written you know a catalog of over 300 songs that you've written yeah. and, and all this has come from John Lennon is that what you're saying right. yeah exactly yeah and it's it's actually over 50 sightings it's not 30 it's 50 uh, and there have been incredible coincidences along the way because this is a long journey I was on GMTV in 1994 and uh, with Eamon Holmes and Lorraine Kelly and Lorraine said, Mike, uh, what do you think if everyone looks in thinks you're completely mad? And I said, well, A, I'm not completely mad, I'm just an ordinary person. Yeah. And B, where did these 125 songs come from? That was at that time in 1994. I mean, so, did, you, did you have any musical talent or, or any artistic no. talent before then? Well, artistic talent, yes, I was at school. The one thing I liked in, in school, the junior and senior schools, were, was art, uh, technical drawing and art and sport, actually. Uh, and when I was nine years of age, I had um, the National Children's Art, the Daily Mirror National Children's Art Exhibition. There was a competition. Uh, anyway, I'd been asking all through the year, from July, I've been saying to my dad, will Father Christmas bring me an oil painting set? And he'd say, we'll see. Uh, anyway, Father Christmas did. And that, that morning, Christmas morning, um, I painted something and he went, who's done that? And I said, me, and I was uh, eight years of age. Uh, so anyway, my mum, uh, we, we lived in a little two up, two down in Liverpool with a tin bath, the usual thing. And our kitchen was like the living room with the main fire. And my mum was peeling some um, onions one day, red onions, and I started painting it. And she said, what are you doing, son? And I said, oh, I'm painting this rare fruit. She said, rare fruit? It's, it's a vegetable. I said, oh, I know. But anyway, I entered this into this um, competition, and I was the only one out of 16,000 in Liverpool that got in. And we went down to London to see this exhibition, and I was so proud. And then it went to the Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool, so that was when I was nine and when I was wow. 11, I had another um, uh, uh, piece of art that I entered, which was my favourite team has always been Liverpool. But Liverpool and Everton Derby games was huge in Liverpool. And I had this, I, I painted it with Ian St. John scoring the winning goal at the Derby. And that got in as well. And I was uh, 11. That was the last time, apart from I, I did my own levels and I did some sculptures and stuff. But since 16 age of 16 to now I've never done anything so it's, it's incredible so. and then suddenly you know you've got some incredible paintings of John yes. uh, and, and of course the very first painting that you painted of him where you saw this vision of him at the end of your bed as you said and then of yes. course of Yoko his wife at the time yes. Um, yes. It, and it, when you when you paint I mean because paint is a very creative expressive thing isn't it Mike so when yeah, you think, yeah, did you feel did you feel you were being guided by John how, how does it feel uh, well yes it did because it didn't have any reference material it's just what I'd seen in my head and and so I had to recall that but I mean if anyone I, I'd, I've said this so many times if anyone had seen what I'd seen you wouldn't forget it in a hurry and as I say these downloads came but the uh, how the mute how how I started painting came about one day I had a manager, Ronan O'Reilly, from Radio Caroline. He'd seen me on GMTV, and uh, he, he, he basically managed us for 12 years. But one evening, he phoned me up, and I was scribbling something. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm just scribbling. He said, can you draw? I said, well, 
not bad. He said, can you paint? And I said, well, I've not painted since I was at school, but he said, well, try and paint these images. And that's how it came about. And I just, and I, and I got uh, all these images, by the way, they're on three foot by two foot canvases in oil. Very, it's a, it's a difficult medium to work in. I was but going I, to say, yeah. absolutely. And, yeah. and I mean, you continue to paint now, Mike, I'm assuming. Yes, yes uh, I, I do, but not, not in as, um, I've not, I've, I've since retired the last couple yes. of months. My whole idea, I've, I've sorted all my paints out and everything, and I'm going to get yeah. sorted out with it. Uh, but there's, uh, there's still several paintings of John that I've seen that I need to paint and get into the collection. So essentially, there'll be at least 50 of these. Uh, and, and the music, Mike, that you've written, you know, it's very, you know, some of it is very different. Some of it is very Beatle-like, you know, we, we can, we can yeah. sense John Lennon's... Um, almost the way that he would write um, in, yeah, yeah. in some of the songs. As you said, you know, it was you. Um, you know, the one that you wrote was, was titled uh, John Lennon. Um, you know, this, the, the, these songs are very, I don't know really how you would describe them because I'm assuming that when you write, again, does the song just come to you? Well, yeah, I mean, I don't, uh, I don't class myself as a songwriter. I'm just this channel for John. Um, you, you, you must be asking yourself, well, how do you, if you've never done anything, how, okay, it was you, how did you get that from, from seeing it to, to playing it and recording it in the studio? And I did it like a, a series of dots, if you like. If you imagine a straight line, this is the way I did it. I got a, a pen and did dots like, I saw your face in a crowd the other day. Go to you, you turn and walk. Dead simple. Uh, but I, I knew the song already, but I was going in, uh, I found a couple of uh, musicians locally and they said, who's done this stuff? And I, said, I played it down and I said, oh, I've done a couple of things. And they said, oh, this is good. That's got a good hang. And they wanted to change it. Musicians always want to put their stamp yes. on it. You know? <laughs> and I, uh, an example was Abbey Road. I did that song and um, mm. they said, oh, we need this change. You can't have that. That's got four six and ten beats to the bar i said i don't care what it's got that's what we've got to do and the cello is going to go in here and i said well how's the cello going to go and i went dum, 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 I was at the time still with my wife, didn't want to disturb her. This was coming through. And, uh, and, and I remember one, one morning, it was two o'clock, and she said, what on earth are you doing? I said, uh, oh, I'm, I'm just writing something down about a bill someone hasn't paid. And I didn't even didn't tell her for a month or two. And then uh, when I played her the, uh, the Yoko one, she said, that's the most beautiful song I've ever heard in my life. You know, where did it come from? So... It's uh, it, it's it's phenomenal, but there's been over 300 songs, over 50 sightings, and the other thing that's kept me on track, <coughs> excuse me, is um, the, a series of coincidences. Because you can imagine, from 38 to 66, yes. there's a lot of years in between, and it's not all high flying and everything. I've, I've maintained this ordinary persona that I am uh, after my normal work. I only retired two months ago. Um, but in between times, there are lows and not 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 lows like desperation, and, but just uh, uh, times when nothing happens. I do, I just thought, well, okay, well, if nothing happens, nothing happens. But then something will happen. A coincidence, an example, when the anthology came out in Penny Lane, there's a barber shop. Yeah, if you, you know that song, yes, Penny I do. Penny. That's right. right. Of course. Well, well. Um, on the anthology, there was a, there was a video, and, and they, they videoed going down Penny Lane, and the barber shop was Tony Slavin's, and my dad was a sign writer, and he signed up that that, uh, that shop. No. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's the, a coincidence. Yeah, that's that's one of fifty. Do I'll you give you find, another you find yeah. Mike, that um, you know these coincidences are, are you know happening? I know that you had the um, easel, didn't you? You bought an yeah, easel. Yeah from yeah. the Liverpool Art College that was used by John Lennon. Is that right? Yes, it is. Well, again, another story. I start, when I started painting, I bought um, 
a small Mickey Mouse easel from a charity shop. I put this uh, this canvas on it and it kept falling over because you put a bit of weight on it, no weight. And I'd said at the time to a girlfriend, I'm going to, I'm going to have to get a, a bigger easel. Anyway, I lived in over near Glossop at the time. And she said, well, it's bank holiday Monday. And I was going for a run. I was supposed to be going for a run with my friends in, uh, in Glossop. And she said, just come to this car boot sale. I went to this car boot sale. Lo and behold, massive, in, in North Wales, huge field. And at the far end, it looked like I saw this huge easel. Anyway, I made my way to it. It was, it was a studio easel, it was seven foot high. Wow. So I thought, I had a look at it and it was £45. And I just, I couldn't, I was trembling. I thought, I'm going to have, that's what I'm going to have. That won't fall over. I bought it and I was walking away with it. And um, this guy said, oh, you might as well have this. And I said, what is it? And he said, a certificate of provenance. And I said, about what? He said, oh, John Lennon painted on this hundreds of times. And I said, no. And he said, yeah. And I said, well, why are you selling it? He said, well, it came from a friend, Derek Hodkin, who was in the same class, John Lennon's best friend, walked to him for college for three years, recorded him on a reel-to-reel tape. And I said, well, I did a long story, but he went to France. He 40 years of marriage, and his girlfriend, when he was 17, when he was with John um, and Cynthia, uh, this girl came over from France. He traced them sold everything and gave, gave everything to his friend. That's how I got the easel. So um, I think I sent the provenance to you, but there is a part of it, which is another coincidence, that there's a P on the top of the um, the, the shaft, if you like, of, of the yes. easel. And that denotes the painting and graphics department. And that's where they did um, uh, lettering. My dad went to that same college. No. Uh, well, he, he went on to be Liverpool's foremost uh, sign writer. He used to do Liverpool Football Club and, oh. you know, so that, that's another coincidence. That this... Yeah, your, your life seems, Michael, like it's just full of these kind of coincidences that are connecting you to John Lennon. But yeah. when, was, when was the last time that you had a sighting of him? The last time was in um, November 19... Two, sorry, 2010. That was the very last one. So that was the, about the 50th or 52nd sighting, uh, and it was very poignant. Uh, and it was a it was a it was a period. It was quite quite strange, really. Um, we were going to Ripley's in London. They'd seen the the uh, general manager and marketing director had come up to North Wales, had a look at these paintings, listened to the songs, and went, "Oh my God, we believe this!" And, and they looked at the coincidences. That you couldn't make up, you just couldn't make up if you tried. But they're all quantifiable. Anyway, uh, th this uh, this particular sighting was something was going to happen in Ripley's. Anyway, uh, and, and and John just came to me that night because it was all I didn't I didn't know what to do. And anyway, I, I was there was something that came up about someone not wanting it the, to be displayed. Anyway, and, and and John came to me and it just it just sort of nodded and yeah. I said oh, yeah okay I'm gonna go and uh, I told my wife and she said that's fine but um, as I say it was uh, it was all connected with uh, Ripley's and uh, it was it was amazing really but that's yeah. part of the story there's a bit more to it but yeah we'll leave that for another day it, it's it's when you're sort of talking about it Mike do you feel still connected to John uh, yes I do because of all this stuff I mean he he doesn't um I would imagine uh, if he if he t if he took the effort to try and get hold of me, which is what I believe he did, and downloaded all this stuff, it, it was for a reason. And the only reason I can think of is that he knows I won't let go, and I'll keep going and keep going, keep on keeping on. That's that's what I'm doing. So I do have a connection with him. I do feel that there's a, there's another song, uh, the bus conductor's last symphony, which. It blows my mind every time I think of it because if if this was produced and a video how how I saw it it would everyone would just they'd say this is incredible this is just amazing uh, so there's this there's so much there's still lots to do you know and, and it sounds like it it sounds yeah, like there's it, lots yeah. to do and and more to come and for the future Mike yeah. what would you like to do would you like to see more of these songs. You know, you know, but getting more yeah. mainstream plays. 
Well, yeah, yeah, I would. I mean, I'm I'm a realist. I'm 66. I'm I'm never going to be in the pop charts doing something, uh, but someone else might. And um, there was uh, Gordon Lorenz was a producer. We did some songs in Abbey Road. He said, "My yes. become standards." Uh, and he said, "The listener in the America one," and he had three people lined up, international artists, to sing them. He passed away. So I don't know who they were, but I think they were linked to Sony. I don't know. But my idea, my hope is anyone who's got a good voice and, you know, ideally is known because if someone's known yes. or, or a crazy John Lennon fan, someone yes. someone who believes in the story that can, that can get through this emotion that I've felt and I, I, I put in the songs because I've never, I've never sang before. But it, it comes from you know, the heart and everything. So that's what I'd like to see. Someone sing them. Um, and there's, there's, there's five al- If someone said we need five albums, I've got them. I've got them. Yes. <laughs> and, and have you ever reached out to any of the family, Mike? Or indeed, if, when, yes. when, I know yeah. you do a lot of television. Did, you, did any of them reach out to you at all, come back to you? No, no. I saw... Um, a few years back when Cynthia Lennon was alive, uh, she, she opened the White Feather exhibition in Liverpool. Mm. Now, the Liverpool uh, the Beatle Museum knew of me. They were going to put a big display on life after death for John Lennon with all these pictures. Anyway, uh, they said, oh, Cynthia and Julian are, are coming to this opening. So I said, they invited me along and I went and spoke to Cynthia, had a heart to heart with her and she grabbed my hand so tight and she said, this is incredible. I believe you. I can't wait to tell Julian because everyone was around Julian. And Cynthia, that's the God's truth. And she said, I'll tell him and we'll get back in touch with him. But they didn't. Oh. So, well, maybe but, after after seeing this today, um, and you know, they'll 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 realize we'll share it with the world and they'll realize yeah. that you're, you're here and you have a point. What do you say? And lastly, Mike, what do you say to people who you know are looking at this and saying, you know, this is complete nonsense? You know, this uh, guy oh. has just made all this up. I mean, you I know that you've had that before in the past. What would you say to them? Um, well, first of all, if you're gonna be completely insane, if you were going from 30 Eight years of old, old to, to 66 and still saying the same thing <laughs> ad nauseum and everyone that knows me knows I'm just an ordinary person um, and you know I'd ask them first of all if they could read the book and see some of the coincidences like my dad ended up he was a sign writer and he bought a, a flash Ford um, Zodiac from a, a commercial body shop in Liverpool and it turned out to be Brian Epstein's Wow. You know, there's, there's so many, uh, but I'd ask them to read the book and listen to the music. All you can do is listen, say, listen to the music and they can think, people can think what they like and they can either go, well, maybe something traumatic happened to them, which it did all those years ago. But this came to me and it's, you know, it's like when you download something on a computer, it's there forever. And this yeah. is, this is and, and it's. I tell you, I could show you boxes of material now where I've scribbled stuff and I, could, I can sing the song just just off these few notes and, you know, so. Uh, so that, seeing is believing, as they say, but it's so difficult. How can you tell until someone else has um, an encounter with someone that's that's not there anymore? Um, there's another song, uh, Mama, I'm Home, which was probably it was the third sighting and it was probably, of all of them, the most poignant because it was the second that John Lennon was killed. Um, the thought, I knew the thoughts that went through his head, I felt, and wow. this is difficult to take That's in. That's very but, powerful, uh, isn't it? Yeah, very yeah. powerful. <laughs> very powerful and very, and very emotive. Yes, well, Mike, it's been yeah. fascinating to speak to you yeah. today. Thank you yeah. so much for joining me, and um, I wish you all the best, and I'm sure we'll catch up again in the future. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, Monica. Thank very you. nice to speak to you. Thank you okay. so much. All right. That's it for this week. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank both of my guests for joining me on this week's show, but thank you so much for joining me. Take care, and I'll speak to you again next week. Bye-bye for now. Take this apple from the sky Take a tree and plant it high She will grow up to the sky Take the apple from the eye I saw the gun, felt no pain I saw the queen in a picture frame 
Looked up flags for millions of stars Messy tunnel, lots and lots of cars Then a smile when I realized Shouted out but to no surprise You were waiting, waiting, you see When you saw it was me and me I shouted, Mama, I'm home again Why did I go? What did I do? Now you say, how do you do? Missed you so much, but I couldn't phone To tell you I was feeling all alone On my own ah. You gotta go away To get back And you're alone I see a studio way up in the hill Big on barn equipped to the hills Rented roof way up from the Thames Some in Pisa, maybe the PS So bald and standing in a doorman Higher water in a tree on the grass Great big castle behind them in a field I saw Judge's multi color Cooper S Got back home and we missed the train we got the bus to Penny Lane Nothing changed, it's still the same We wrote a song and we gave it fame I shouted Mama, I'm alive again No, no need to disguise again Mama, can we watch Bill and Ben? Mama, is there still news at 10? Mama, it's just great to be back home Wake your brother Dream. Let's take a boat way upstream Let's dream of what will be, will be See what's on the music scene Shining bright Why was he taken? Where did he go? And forever has he gone? John Lennon is back to gone Nameless faces in flannel gray suits Glasses hiding the rise from view and sneak in New York City What are they gonna do with me? Cold Spring King 